Okay. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome. Cynthia Tomain here with Interactive Brokers, and thank you for joining today's webinar being brought to us by EQ Derivatives. Topic today is going to be on the NDX option strategies for bullish, bearish, and neutral markets. Now, with us today, I'm very pleased to have uh, Russell Rhodes, a highly regarded strategist and educator and consultant, among other things, uh, he's accomplished in his 25-year career. Now, he's probably best known to IB clients um, as, uh, or IB audience, for the decade he spent as Director of Education with the CPOE Options Institute. In his role, his current duties as Head of Research at EQ Derivatives, um, Russell is also a Professor of Finance at Loyola uh, university and is currently pursuing a PhD from Oklahoma State University as well. So would you please join me in welcoming Russell for today's presentation. Russell, I'm going to go ahead, pass you those controls. So if you can simply share your screen, let's get underway here today. <laughs> Thanks for joining okay. us, Russell. You bet. Can you, are, are you seeing this? In full screen. It looks great. Awesome. Awesome. All right. We are in great. And I'm going to do something on my end where I'm able to see questions as they come in. Uh, I thank you very much for the very nice introduction. I always I think my mom would be so proud when she reads what other people write about me. Uh, before I get going, as always, we have disclosure. Uh, I'm actually going to talk about a kind of a systematic approach to trading options, which is for educational purposes only. Uh, I'm not directly affiliated with Interactive Brokers, although I've been a client with Interactive Brokers, gosh, since the 90s. Uh, and I really do enjoy doing Interactive Broker webcasts because I feel like uh, the, the people that end up coming on and listening and asking me questions, they make me think a little bit harder than normal, uh, but you also give me ideas to work with. And today's webcast actually comes from a question from one of you guys. So. Uh, I greatly, uh, you know, I, I'm totally open to feedback. I've got my uh, email address at the end of the presentation as well. So I'm going to talk about the it, it, the NASDAQ 100 real quick. I'm going to talk about the NASDAQ Volatility Index, uh, VolQ. Uh, if you're not aware, uh, VolQ futures started trading at CME Group uh, uh, yesterday. For the yesterday, I think Sunday night they started trading, but. Uh, yesterday was the first trading day that they have VolQ futures uh, available. Uh, I've been using VolQ for a while now uh, to to help me trade uh, different strategies using NDX options. VolQ is nothing; uh, it's nothing more than a 30-day outlook for volatility based on Nasdaq 100 option prices. Uh, it's a, a nice, uh, consistent measure of 30-day implied volatility using NDX options. But I've found that Volatility indexes like VolQ are pretty helpful with respect to figuring out what strikes might make sense when you're putting on different spreads. Uh, I'll talk about how I go about converting VolQ to, uh, or what the market is actually forecasting and, and how I use that to, to choose strikes. And then we're gonna take a look at a pretty interesting trading approach. Somebody uh, pulled something, I'm not 100% sure what book they pulled it from because they sent me a, a picture. Uh, but somebody uh, pulled a strategy from a book from the 90s, uh, a book about options, and said, do you think this would work with NDX options? So I went out and tested it. I used VolQ to, to pick the strikes when I tested it. And so far, it looks kind of good. So um, with that, I'm going to move forward. The NASDAQ, the NDX 100, uh, NASDAQ 100, it's 100 of the largest companies on the NASDAQ stock market. Uh, Tech, everybody thinks of it as a technology index. Needless to say, with the uh, top 10 stocks in that index representing about half of the cap market capitalization, and I think all of them right now being what we would think of as tech stocks, uh, it, it, it just carries that moniker with it. Uh, it's been a great year for the NASDAQ 100. Uh, it, it held up better back in March when we had some of the issues that we had. Of course, uh, some of the companies that, that comprise the NASDAQ 100 uh, benefited from uh, the, the change in the world that we've all dealt with over the past few months. Uh, things like Zoom, uh, things like, uh, you know, definitely Amazon, uh, which I think we have a personal relationship with the Amazon delivery guy here at the Rhodes household. 
Uh, but it's been a great year for the NASDAQ 100, uh, just on absolute terms, but even when you compare it to other broad-based indexes as well. <clears throat> and just as I mentioned, uh, yeah, everything up here is pretty much a technology stock. I mean, Tesla, uh, let's call it an auto technology stock. Uh, and then Google, uh, Google gets, uh, uh, there are two versions of Google into the NASDAQ 100. That's why I've uh, changed the ticker around a little bit. But here are the biggest stocks in, in the index. Uh, I updated this from a webcast I did two or three months ago, and there were no changes in the top five. Uh, Tesla moved up, and I think PayPal might have moved in as well over the past few months. But for the most part, uh, the, the top 20 stocks are pretty consistent with respect to the NASDAQ 100. So just a quick look at what NDX options are. They are cash settled options uh, with the exception of the third Friday uh, option contracts. They settle on the close. Uh, the standard third Friday options are actually still AM settled options. I'm actually going to use a combination of AM and PM settled options when I talk about the strategy that was recommended to me and then appears to look pretty good uh, through some of the work that I did. Uh, but the Monday and Wednesday options expire are, are all PM settled. Uh, the only one that's an AM settled at this point is the non-standard third Friday options. And actually I've got a, uh, got a quick list here. I just pulled the uh, ex expiring option contracts as of uh, last Monday. And there were, my, you can just see, I'm gonna, Pull up my little laser pointer here. Uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Monday, Wednesday, third Friday. Um, that's where, you know, that's coming up next week. But uh, when we start to get out to the longer dated options, you can see you can express an opinion on the NASDAQ 100 uh, it, that, that expires in December of 2022 right now. That's, uh, uh, Goodness knows, two years ago, we wouldn't have anticipated we are, we'd are we be where we are right now. I really wouldn't want to try to be making a prediction. Uh, wouldn't want to be a futurist trying to figure out where we are going to be around Christmas time in 2022. So I get a lot of questions when I'm talking about NDX options with respect to the QQQ options. Uh, they both basically give you exposure to the uh, NASDAQ 100 performance. Uh, the Qs or the ETF that gives you that exposure uh, using some recent pricing. Uh, you can see one NDX option uh, with a quote of 11,000, just using the at the money, uh, would be a notional of $1.1 million. The triple Qs would actually, uh, same, at about the same time, uh, will have a notional of $26,850. In fact, this number would look more dramatic if I had uh, taken the cents out of this uh, num number should end right there. And then you know, the QQQ options, we have their Friday options and their end of the quarter, they're always PM settled. NDX options, we've got Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and as I mentioned, AM and versus AM settled for the third Friday and PM settled as well. Uh, one of the things that I really prefer about NDX options or any broad-based options when, when we're looking at index options versus ETF options is this cash settlement. If I'm, you know, on the, actually, uh, I was recently on the road and I had um, the, um, I was on the road and had the, uh, had an NDX position on that was slightly in the money and wasn't able to check on it around the market close, it ended up uh, being a short option that I lost a little money on but I didn't have to worry about having a position in the queues the following day, uh, which is what would happen if you had an in the money option contract and you went through the assignment or settlement process. I've just always, if I, you know, we all lose money on trades every once in a while. Uh, and I, I would prefer to not be concerned about taking delivery of the, um, taking delivery of the physical QQQ. And um, so, the NASDAQ 100 volatility index, ball q I mentioned it's a consistent measure of ex expected volatility for the NASDAQ 100 over the net following 30 days. Uh, and it uses the Valdex methodology, which comes from uh, 
uh, Scott Mason's firm. I think I see him in the audience. Uh, and it uses the first and second in the money options and first and second out of the money call and put options. So we're bracketing a 30-day time frame using multiple expirations with the NDX options, and you're getting a consistent measure. Uh, it's a little bit more of an at-the-money measure than some of the other volatility indexes out there, but that also uh, means that we are getting a, a measure of expected volatility from the most actively traded options on the NDX. We don't have out-of-the-money options that uh, a small trade may move the index around with. So. Uh, that's one of the, uh, I, I consider that one of the uh, positive, uh, one of the positive things about uh, VOLQ or one of the superior things about the Baldex methodology as well. Um, I do, there's a question on here about VOLQ on the IV work system uh, workstation. When Cynthia joins me toward the end, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Just wanted Helen to know that I, I see what you're asking. And uh, Asad, there should be a uh, there should be a recording afterwards. Um, so uh, here's just the Nasdaq versus VOLQ. If I didn't put uh, what indexes these were on this chart, uh, anybody that it's even a casual market observer would probably assume that we're looking at a broad-based stock market index versus a volatility index because uh, all broad-based in Typically, you don't say all, but it, in my experience, every broad-based index that has a volatility index based on the option pricing has this sort of inverse relationship. It's just uh, common across the board, and it's uh, common for the behavior of broad-based index options as well, where the implied volatility tends to run up when uh, we have some sort of market concern or market sell-off and tends to work its way down uh, when we get some sort of an uptrend. Uh, this year is a little bit of an anomaly just because we've got a big event uh, in the first week of November. And so uh, markets are a little bit more on edge than they would normally be uh, this time of year, uh, just because of the uncertainty around the 2020 election and uh, the 2016 election surprise being still in everybody's memory. So, what strategy did was suggested to me, and what did I go through doing some uh, testing of? Well, uh, again, I, I was just somebody emailed me a picture they'd taken with their iPhone of a strategy out of a book. So I, I'm not trying to steal something from the book. I just don't know what book it came from. And the book suggestion was uh, back before we had as many expirations as we have now. Uh, we only had standard third Friday expirations, and it suggested buying a longer dated strangle and selling monthly strangles against that longer dated strangle. So <clears throat> what I did was I took that, kind of ran with it, and I decided to take a look at what if you buy a three-month strangle and then you sell weekly strangles against it? And you'd use vol Q to, to dictate both the strike prices for both the long strangle and the short strangles. And um, you just keep the three, I just kept the three month strangle on in the testing. There's actually an instance here where you might consider uh, abandoning the whole strategy because of some market movements that were going on. So, how do I use vol Q to come up with a uh, different day forecast. Uh, and, and again, vol Q is an annualized number. Volati implied volatility is an annualized number. So in order to take implied volatility and convert it to uh, even as short as a one day um, outlook, uh, this is basically the formula. It's vol Q. In fact, I'm right here, I should have, uh, instead of five, I should have the word trading days or days. But uh, we take ball Q, divide it by 100, so we turn it into you know, 0.2568, and we end up with a number that converts nicely to a percentage. Uh, in this case, I was using, uh, I was looking at the market on August 7th, which was a Friday, and looking at the August 14th options, which expired uh, five trading days down the road. And I like to use trading days, and 252 is the denominator. Uh, you can you can also use calendar days. I just feel like there's a little bit more exactness by uh, using this formula, especially when we get into holiday times. So 
based on vol q at 25.68 and the nasdaq at 11,139.39 um we first off i come up with a five-day up or down one standard deviation forecast of 3.62 percent uh, which is basically when you take implied volatility and convert it like this it's giving you a you know the, the one standard deviation up or down range and taking uh 1.3 or 0 0.0362 uh, subtracting it from one adding it to one and multiplying it times uh where the nasdaq was where the nasdaq 100 was at that moment uh i get these two figures right here and you know not an exact strike but uh you know close to strikes and any number is going to be close to strikes and in this case a uh you know a one standard deviation strangle you could buy it or sell it uh is actually you know it's going to use the uh 10,725 puts and the 11,550 calls and this is based on a five-day forecast using ball cue converting ball cue to uh to a five-day forecast and we had a question about a recording being available this presentation is available so don't you know don't you can for download don't kill yourself trying to write the, the formulas down right now you can you can totally have access to it so i also look and this is actually going to be the beginning of one of these short versus long strangle trades um, so again we've got vol q on june 19th which was standard june expiration and standard september expiration of this year of 2020 was 63 trading days into the future so i taking vol q which was up at 2761 um we came i came up with a up or down one standard deviation move for the nasdaq 100 of 13.81 or converting both of these uh came up with the the 8600 was the closest put strike we didn't have the 8625s and 11400 was the call strike of 11390 i uh, just rounded it up to 11400 i both of this is rounded down and that's rounded up i really do normally go for the closest um, strike price but in both of these cases it involved rounding to the out rounding to the downside and rounding to the upside so the strategy i'm going to show you actually started out with this trade right here it started out with buying the uh standard september 18th 8600 put and turning around and buying the um 11,400, um, yeah, the 11,400 call. And that's the first part of the trade right there. Uh, the 8,600 put was trading for 234 bucks. I know that's a pretty pricey option there. Uh, and the 11,400 call was trading at $60. And look at that. I mean, this is down one standard deviation and this is up one standard deviation. This is a great insight into how dramatic skew can be and this shows up over and over again with the premium differences between the put options and the call options so the beginning of the trade involved buying this strangle with the intent of holding it through expiration and then the first short trade sold the ndx uh, the june 26th options that expired the next week and using that same mathematical convention i came up with the 9625 put and the 10400 call and so the net result here is a uh, initial cost of, of 214 points i forgot to include that down here at the bottom so i got to do that math real quick so the initial cost was uh 214 dollars uh, to buy this strangle and sell this strangle and i repeated this process every week through september 18th expiration and this these columns right here i i did my very best to put as little information on here as possible so that uh everybody can follow along but the long strangle this is the long strangle p l over the life of the trade the next week uh the 
NDX did not move a whole lot. The strangle basically lost about the time value. Uh, the following week, uh, we actually started to see a little bit of a, uh, you know, a drop in the value. Uh, there was some volatility between June and September standard expiration. And at one point, this strangle was actually a positive $420, just the strangle by itself. And I think anybody that might be trading this sort of strategy, if something like this happened, you might say, you know what? I think I'm just going to sell that strangle and then start looking at uh, re-implementing the trade and buying another longer dated strangle. Uh, it, 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 I think it'd be very difficult to walk away from this situation right here, where the running PNL was actually up at 678 points. So these lines right here, actually, this trade and this trade would have been put on on 619, but it expires on 626. Just to make things simple, I put those two trades on the expiring lines. And we took in $80 on that first one, uh, and the, the strangle expired out of the money, and we got to keep that $80 because both options expired. We experienced some time decay right here, so the running P&L was $55. Now, the next couple of weeks in early July, we did have some extra volatility. And the short strangles lost $50 and $96 collectively. However, we did see a little bit of a bump up in the long strangle. You can see right here, the long strangle is actually an unrealized profit. So we had a $46 unrealized profit on the long strangle, uh, but we had, you know, we had a loss of $96 here. Our Running PL for the uh, selling of the strangles was minus $66. This is the cumulative PL for the short strangle. And the running total PL uh, dips down. We start to make some money off of the short strangles. And lo and behold, we come back to you know, nice profits mostly being made by the short strangles. The only other time that this strangle, uh, the short strangle, ended up uh, Slightly in the money was the one traded on August 21st for the August 28th expiration. And um, that one was not, it was, it was in the money, but not in the money to the point of overwhelming the amount of, um, the, the amount of premium that you took in when you sold that strangle. Um, so these are just the running results of buying the strangle and then shorting weekly strangles as we go along. Uh, and so I, you know, I, this, this is great. You know, first, first look back period here and got really nice results. And uh, because this is a little bit of a manual process for me to, to run, I actually, instead of starting to go backwards, um, I, I, you know, and do each quarter, uh, I actually wanted to go to a low volatility environment to see how it works as well. And Michael's asking, am I using NDX or the Qs? I'm using NDX options for this strategy. Uh, although my assumption is the same thing might uh, probably would work with the Qs as well. Uh, and, and in fact, because Qs only have Friday expirations, that's one of the reasons I used Friday expirations across the board on this one as well. So just, uh, if people wanted to consider using that approach. Um, <clears throat> so as I was saying, I wanted to apply the same strategy to a low volatility environment, just see how that worked out. And that would be uh, June of the June 2019 to, and I apologize, this should say, get out, and that should say to, September 19. So basically repeated the exact same process. Uh, bought the September 21st of 2019 strangle. Uh, notice the, uh, the, uh, the NDX was at a much lower level back then. And if I remember correctly, Vol Q was in the low teens. Uh, so the long strangle only has a spread of 1,400 points, uh, whereas the first strangle had a much, much wider spread. 
of, of um, trying to check my math again right here. I had a, uh, a, a spread of, where is my first one? Um, I can't find the math on that one. Um, oh, there it is. It's uh, 1400. It, it has a spread of like 2,800 points. Uh, so you can see that implied volatility. Um, um, so the, uh, you know, the, um, the implied volatility was so much lower. Uh, the sell to the, uh, you know, and then we, the next Friday was the uh, June 28th expiration. And this is a pretty narrow spread as well. Uh, and a lot less premium being taken in the first time that we, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that, that we put this spread on and went through the 13-week process once again. Uh, so in this case, it's a much less expensive uh, strangle on both sides, uh, but this one actually worked out fairly well. Uh, the long strangle cost 124 points. The first time out uh, was 27 points. Uh, we only had $2 worth of time decay, and in fact, uh, with one exception, the long strangle continuously lost value. Uh, it, uh, yeah, it, it, the one exception was a small bump up uh, right here, and you can see that bump up actually had a pretty negative impact on the uh, long strangle as well, uh, or in the short strangle as well. So it got run over in early August. It seems like as I eyeball these things, it tends to get run over at least one time, um, but usually ends up uh, writing itself within a few weeks. Uh, so using this in a low volatility environment, actually worked particularly well as well. Uh, and it's kind of interesting down here, uh, we actually end up with uh, so much time decay and so little movement out of the uh, NDX that uh, that long strangle, basically, uh, you wouldn't have been able to get very much for it at all, even with a couple of weeks left to standard uh, September expiration. Um, so, and Michael's asking why, uh, you know, why NDX over QQQ? Well, um, you know, I basically it matches up with the uh, the size that I tend to uh, yeah, that I like to trade, and um, I don't really ever want to take. Uh, I, I really don't want to go through physical delivery. And as Cynthia mentioned at the beginning of the webcast, uh, I'm a professor at Loyola. I'm actually teaching sometimes when the market's closing. Uh, typically on Wednesdays, and I do trades that expire on Wednesday, I really would much rather go through the uh, cash settlement. But also, uh, I've been trading a handful of strategies using NDX options for a while now, and the screen spread looks kind of daunting. But you also have to keep in mind that the at this point, the notional on NDX options is about a million bucks. Uh, so trying to get the same sort of exposure with QQQ options uh, is going to widen the dollar amount. But I've really found when, and, and Interactive Brokers does a great job with the uh, option execution software where it shows you the midpoint of the spreads that you want to trade. And I've found that if I, if I take the midpoint and I give up a nickel or so, that I typically get filled on spread trades. Uh, as one of the liquidity providers will grab that thing. And then I'm not concerned about liquidity of exiting the trade because I'm going to hold the trade through expiration. So I like, I mean, I've always preferred uh, index options and cash settlement over ETF options uh, just because I get more exposure with fewer options. Uh, but also just about every um, broad-based trade I do I do with the intent of holding through expiration. And um, just that, so that's, that's really why I really do prefer the index options over the ETF options. Um, so that was, so went through the strategies. Uh, there are lots of other, <laughs> you're welcome, Michael. He said, thank you for the detailed answer. Um, so there are alternatives to this approach. Um, Personally, now I've just shown you a strategy that sells options on Friday afternoons, uh, and I did that for consistency sake. But personally, I've never really liked selling options on Friday afternoons. I don't feel like you're getting properly compensated for the, uh, the weekend uh, risk that you take on. 
So I, I, the time values, there's a, a time value adjustment that market makers seem to do on Friday afternoons that uh, makes selling options on Fridays uh, something that I generally avoid, even though I just showed you uh, doing something along those lines. Uh, I do think I, I've had a lot of success trading the Wednesday NDX options in a different method in a webcast that I um, uh, that I did for IB a couple of months ago. Uh, so you know, instead of doing Friday options, maybe looking at Wednesday options versus the uh, owning the longer dated strangle, which is going to expire on a Friday. Uh, you know, if you get a big market move like August of 2020. Uh, it, it, there's really no reason why a human trader would, you know, you've got something automatically trading, it's going to follow the rules to the end. But you see a gain of, you know, 670 points on an option strategy uh, that's taking advantage of time decay for the most part, you probably want to take that off. And then, you know, if, if you've done something like, if you were doing something like this, take that trade off then look maybe out to the December options and buy a strangle and start selling against that one or something along those lines. But a really big market move that results in uh, a very large unrealized profit in the long strangle may be something that you would want to uh, trade around. Uh, possibly exiting the long strangle if it has enough value before expiration. And the reason I bring that one up, I'm actually gonna go backwards real quick to the uh, right here. Uh, even with, with a week to go, um, you could have sold the long strangle on September 11th. You could have just sold it for 61 points uh, versus taking in 76 points for selling these two options. That might have been a better alternative. Um, just going ahead and exiting it and starting looking farther out. Uh, if the premium for these two options, which would have been sold on this date, if the premium added up to something less than this number, uh, you probably would be better suited just going ahead and getting out of the trade. So there are some logic components to this. Uh, I just got a question about uh, the day count convention. Uh, when I say points, one point is $100, not a dollar. Um, so uh, a couple of other things I just needed to mention and somebody asked me a question about it. Uh, I, the, the, Third Friday options are AM settled, and this strategy would sell if you went standard expiration to standard expiration. <clears throat> you would trade uh, third Friday options a couple of times. Uh, just for consistency sake, I still use five days as the um, in the calculation to choose the strikes. Uh, you end up uh, going through the AM settlement process. Uh, but you end up going, you know, I, I just have used, I just consist, consistently use five days instead of four days uh, just to keep things uh, simple. So, you know, with that, something that appears to work in a variety of environments, something I definitely want to do more work on. Uh, I love questions from you guys that lead to basically something like this. Uh, this is really a result of uh, somebody that saw me talk about uh, volume and NDX a couple of months ago with Interactive Brokers and specifically sent me a question that I felt somewhat matched up to the topic that I was gonna talk about today. Uh, different strategies that I um, write up, I actually uh, do more, do, I update how they're working out more on the NASDAQ blog site. I, I'm posting about every week or two there uh, this strategy and explanation of this strategy actually showed up there recently. Uh, some other things that I've been that, that I've come across uh, using NDX options uh, and VolQ show up there as well. Uh, as we start to see the VolQ futures uh, trading a little bit uh, a little bit more, uh, I'll definitely be, uh, be taking a look at how uh, strategies that work in other volatility derivatives work in VolQ derivatives. So. Um, with that, I'll see. Sometimes Cynthia sees questions I don't see. Um, I'm open to any other questions that come along. And Cynthia, you wanna are you gonna jump on or? 
Sometimes Here I am. Sometimes. I'm in the background. Okay. <laughs> um, I was just on mute. What I would like to do is remind everyone, if you've got any questions for Russell at this point, go ahead and add them into that questions panel over on the right-hand side of your screen. I also want to point out um, that I have included the slides that Russell's using today, is, uh, or they are available for download before you do exit the session. It's uh, notice on the right-hand side of your screen where you do find that control panel, you'll see a handouts pane that's available and simply double click and download the slides from here. Um, as a reminder, we have been recording today's event and each of you will get a direct link to today's recorded playback uh, soon after today's session ends. Also notice Russell has been terrific in answering questions and providing you with his contact information. So if you do have any additional questions, you can always contact uh, Russell directly as well. Um, any qu any more questions that you did want to go through, Russell? Um, there there was the question about VolQ and your platform. Okay, um, I, think, I go ahead. I was going to say I think that it's really close to being included, but it might not that's, be there quite yet. Um, that's what I was going to say. The last time I yeah. checked, I knew it was being added, um, and I'm not seeing it just now. So what I will do is mm -hmm. I'll respond to everyone. I'll double check on that and include that with today's follow-ups as well. Okay. Um, no, so I, know, I don't I have an exact answer here, but I know that they were uh, looking to add it uh, the last time we discussed this. Mm -hmm. No, and I've, I've been beating up on them a little bit, and this will give me a little bit of more ammo to go beat up on them again to make sure we, we get it over there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Oh. All right. All right. Well, All right. With that, then, Russell, I want to thank you very much you for bet. today's presentation. This is terrific here today. Um, and let everyone know that we've got Russell Books coming back next month. Um, he'll be back to uh, on another topic, and we'll be discussing that uh, later on today. But do mark your calendars. I've got Russell on November 10th. Uh, harvesting volatility risk will be the topic then. So can't wait till you're back to join us one more time. Thanks so much, Russell, for today's presentation. Well, with that, uh, we are going to conclude today's event. You can all exit using the X in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Thanks, everyone. Watch your inbox for a replay of today's session, um, and we'll see you next time.